Welcome everybody to today's panel. This is The Lie Became the Truth, Locating Trans Narratives in Queer History. Everyone's been on lately about revisionist history and the inclusion of narratives that don't privilege straight white landowning males in the historical narrative. Queer history, women's history, African-American history, Latinx history, and a whole host of others have taken advantage of this and made their contributions to the field of history, making it richer. However, within each of these subfields, there's often controversy about narratives that continue to be left out. Within queer history, many critics have noted that there's a privileging of the narratives of gay men and women. In other words, gay men and lesbians. The papers in the panel today are going to explore how queer history tends to ignore or outright erase the experiences of trans individuals. I'm Christopher Rose with St. Edwards University in Austin, Texas, and Our Lady of the Lake University in San Antonio, Texas, and I will be moderating today's panel, which features Matthew Schilling, who is currently working as a middle school educator and previously con completed degrees at the University of Oregon and Augustana University in Economics and History, and Caitlin Hartweave, who is a doctoral candidate at George Mason University. We're going to begin with Matthew, whose paper, The Question of Queerness and Soft Erasure, will be our first presentation. Matthew has published Political Failure and Ideological Victory, Ida Wells and her early work with the New Aaron's Journal of American Studies and presented other works at the Augustana Symposium. His current research interest focuses on early queer communities and the development of shared queer identities and queer advocacy groups, as well as the intersection between race-based civil rights movements and queer rights movements. Before we begin this session, however, we would like to acknowledge that the Ask Historians Digital Conference is taking place on the ancestral, unceded, and treated territories of many Indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. We offer our gratitude to these peoples and recognize that colonial nations continue to benefit from the brutality that enabled the original settler colonizers to seize these lands. The AHDC organizers acknowledge both the land upon which we are virtually hosting this conference and the deep-rooted and long-lasting harms caused by white imperialism and settler colonialism. We invite you to read our full land acknowledgement and the names of the peoples upon whose land this conference is taking place in the video description below. All right, Matthew, you're up. Take it away. On October 24th, 2014, Vine user Matt Sukar uploaded a video that launched a thousand memes. A woman talking on the phone saying, and they were roommates, followed by Matt looking into the camera and saying, oh my God, they were roommates. The original Vine, now inaccessible with Vine's closing, was re-uploaded on numerous other sites, namely Tumblr, where it became used as a shorthand meme for queer erasure both in casual settings and more perniciously among historical discussions. Familiar with older narratives that cast queer relationships as mere friends or cousins and cast trans identities as merely cross-dressers, many online queer spaces view academic history with a justified suspicion. And as of late, there has been greater focus on trans identities, particularly within political contexts, and a greater ire from these communities at the opposition to the mere use of words like queer, trans, or lesbian in historical contexts. At a time when such identities face political opposition to their existence, fights over their use in historical discussions take on new importance. This presentation will look at both trans and lesbian histories and their erasure in history through a framework of hard erasure and soft erasure. Hard erasure is the active rejection of the validity of a self-identified category in general. It's where they don't just deny that a sp specific person was trans, but that anyone could be trans. By contrast, soft erasure doesn't necessarily argue against someone's identity as a whole, but rather that a specific individual shouldn't be called trans, and does so using tools that aren't necessarily wrong, but rather are selectively applied, and create a different set of standards for discussing queer histories than for non-queer ones. So this framework was discussed in part by previous works such as Heterosexuality as a Threat to Medieval Studies by James Schultz and Lesbian Like in the Social History of Lesbians by Judith Bennett. 
These works presented the argument that queerness and queer identities are subjected to a greater scrutiny in academia than other subjects, including other sexualities and identities that fit in a more heteronormative mold. Schultz notes that it's common for academics to use terms such as same-sex attraction or same-sex relations when discussing homosexuality, often with the note that homosexuality as a concept did not appear until 1868 in Richard von Kraft Ebbing's Psychopathia Sexualis. But these works contrast same-sex attraction with heterosexuality, which also did not appear until Psychopathia Sexualis in 1868. Bennett in her article makes a similar objection for the term lesbian, noting that even setting aside historical lesbian being a term for women attracted to women or who have sex with other women well throughout antiquity, these concerns are selective and are applied to other modern terms and identities that have changed over time, like capitalist or Catholic or democratic. Bennett also observes that the concern over retroactively applying a modern definition of lesbian presumes a modern definition of lesbian, arguing that when you actually are in these queer spaces, you see that there is a great debate over what the term lesbian actually means and can encompass. And thus these papers kind of misleadingly narrow the discussion. This in turn privileges a heterosexual narrative, which is free to be expanded into the past where the queer cannot go. An example of this can be seen in Bev Roberts' edited volume of Anne Drysdale's Diaries. Drysdale recorded her experience living with Carolyn Newcomb for 13 years, and Anne was later named Newcomb's heir over Newcomb's surviving family and was buried alongside Newcomb when she died several years later. These two were featured in an exhibit at Museum Victoria, focusing on queer history in Australia, and the museum noted that Drysdale and Newcomb were described by friends as close partners and kindred spirits, and her eulogy described them as linked by the closest affections. But Bev Roberts objected to this, saying that the whole of the Museum Victoria's project was fraught with conceptual and methodological pointless problems and calling all speculation about the sexuality of the two futile as well as pointless. But Roberts inadvertently revealed a kind of incoherency in her position by noting that she wrote to the museum with these objections and the museum's response was that Roberts had not presented any evidence that the two weren't queer and thus the removal of them would not be justified. Roberts presents this as a kind of absurdity, but this assumes that queerness would require more proof than a mere friendship. And here, rather than producing strong scholarship or engaging in a strong debate, this approach merely codifies heteronormativity as the professional standard. This erasure can also be seen in related fields. Uh, as historians grapple more with the limitations of the written record alone, there has been greater reliance on archaeological evidence to reconstruct parts of history that would otherwise go unobserved. But this approach still has its limitations and can still contribute to erasure as seen with the Lovers of Medina. Originally discovered in 2009, the Lovers of Medina were the remains of two individuals buried sometime during the Roman period in Medina. Upon the first discovery, the Lovers were discussed as evidence for burial practices in the region for couples or lovers, and academics in Italy kind of use the two as shorthand for discussing romantic relationships. But later work in 2019 found the lovers were, contrary to their original belief, actually two men. And the paper that the research team that discovered this immediately changed the interpretation from the two being lovers to being cousins or perhaps comrades at war. And while there exist reasons to be skeptical that the two were lovers, or that these remains should be interpreted that way, these objections were only raised after the discovery that both were men and thus contribute to the erasure. If the concerns existed about calling the two lovers without further evidence, the only evidence being that they were buried together with hands linked, those objections were just as valid prior to discovery that they were both men.
It's easy and more common to see this within discussions of trans identities. Murray Hall was a Tammany Hall politician who garnered some attention on his death in the early 1900s as the coroner report determined that Hall was biologically female. But Hall's friends and family insisted he was a man, with one testifying to the coroner if he was a woman, he ought to have been born a man, for he lived and looked like one. Nonetheless, numerous scholars identified Hall instead as a lesbian woman, starting with Jonathan Ned Katz in his 1967 Gay American History, arguing that Hall took on the identity of a man to escape the stigma of lesbianism, a claim that was later repeated in Jeffrey Escoffier's 2004 article, New York City. Such reports fail to explain why Hall's family would identify him as male after his death, or why Hall himself would have presented as male even to his family. But similar claims were made about others, such as jazz musician Billy Tipton, who lived from no later than 1940 until his death is 1989, presenting as a male. Tipton's case is perhaps more egregious because Tipton didn't just live as a man. The idea that he would live so for purposes of escaping a lesbian stigma ignore that he told his partners that he was disfigured in a car accident and couldn't have sex. He also forewent seeking medical treatment to maintain his male identity and ended up dying of untreated illnesses for that reason. Explanations of Tipton as a lesbian don't really explain why he would have chosen to deliberately lie to his partners and to medical professionals, particularly when, by the end of his life, the stigma of lesbianism wouldn't have been that damaging. And some alternative theories were provided as well that were also part of erasure. Lillian Faderman in 1991 suggested instead that Tipton feigned a male identity to accomplish success as a jazz musician, but didn't explain why he would have maintained that identity after retiring from jazz music. While this began as an academic endeavor, the rising awareness of trans identities brought with it extreme political backlash, especially in the United Kingdom, and erasure using the same tropes here against trans people as a whole. Prominent figures within anti-trans movements frequently spoke about the supposed erasure of other queer identities by trans identities, such as Julie Bendel's complaints in The Spectator in June of 2021, bemoaning a supposed suppression of lesbians at a pride by the existence of trans rights movements, or Pride co-founder Fred Sargent, who claimed in July of 2020 that trans people have no early history, so they have to take LGB figures and trans them to create a history, citing Marsha Johnson as an example. The unmistakable political motives here also join with those opposing trans identities for vague claim of feminism without any specific reference to other queer identities, such as author Helen Joyce. Helen Joyce in her writings claimed that trans identities represent some kind of new patriarchy harming women but also came with a racist narratives. In a Quillette article published in December of 2018, Joyce insisted that a, quote, true cross-sex identity did not appear until the 1930s among male cross-dressers in Germany. And this unfortunately mirrors previous academic works that recharacterize trans figures as merely cross-dressers, such as Hall and Tipton. Joyce's particular stance against trans identities might be extreme in comparison, but it is not a mistake on her part that her arguments against a general trans identity so closely match arguments against identifying specific individuals in history as trans. And just as erasure in the political sphere has real harms, there are real harms to the innocent until proven queer approach in historical fields. For queer historians, seeing arguments deployed presently against their queer identities be used in discounting historical examples of queerness can send a message of being unwelcome or not fully part of the identity of historians. 
but there are further harms to the field that in rather than engaging a robust discussion of these identities and how they have evolved, the insistence on avoiding anachronism has made these discussions stilted or just non-existent. While it's true that sexuality and gender identities have changed over time, and there are inherent issues in identifying a historical figure as being the same as a modern trans identity, the unique focus on preventing the anachronistic interpretation of trans, lesbian, or other queer identities stack the deck against queerness and end up producing histories that are just absent of what we know to have been there. This ends up producing, rather than avoiding forcing a modern interpretation on the past by putting back queer identities, it forces a modern heteronormativity upon the past where it was not present either. These, this erasure has both consequences within the political, the political sphere and the historical sphere, and is something that historians should be more aware of and concerned about when arguing against a specific interpretation of queer history. Thanks, Matt. I have so many questions, but we have another paper to get through. So let's turn to Caitlin Hartweave. Uh, Caitlin is a doctoral candidate at George Mason University. She specializes in the 18th century Atlantic world and digital history with a focus on gender and gender nonconformity. Her research examines the recurring language and narrative themes gender nonconforming individuals in the 18th century British and French empires used to define themselves and their genders. Through her research, she hopes to recover the stories of oft ignored gender nonconforming individuals, as well as contribute to the LGBT plus community's history beyond Stonewall. Her paper is Warrior Women, the Chevalier Dion and Trans Narratives in the 18th century Atlantic world. Caitlin, take it away. In September 1777, patrons of the London Magazine opened their papers to astonishing news from nearby France. The headline article reported on the extraordinary life of the Chevalier Dion, a French noble, former dragoon captain, diplomat, and spy. Dion appearing in the news was nothing new. For service to France during the Seven Years' War, Dion had been knighted and received the title of Chevalier, French for knight. After the war, Dion was sent to London as a minister and frequently appeared in dramatic public squabbles with the French ambassador. For all of these accomplishments and affairs, the Chevalier Dion was well known in France, Britain, and America, but these were not the subject of the London magazine's interest. In 1777, after living for 50 years as a man, Dion shocked the world by appearing at the French royal court in full women's clothing. She declared that she was and always had been a woman, and the British and French courts accepted her story. She rewrote her life story, creating a narrative of a girl raised as a boy by parents desperate to secure an inheritance and elevated to great political success, until the ruse, as she put it, could go on no longer. What the London Magazine was reporting on that September was an astonishingly high profile case of gender nonconformity that fascinated the Atlantic world. Stories of gender nonconforming individuals fascinated 18th century society. Scandalous stories of fops, fribbles, and female husbands spread across France, Britain, and their American colonies. These tales told of women passing as men to go to war or even to marry other women. Others spoke of men dressing as women to sneak into the chambers of their married mistresses or spread rumors of a colonial governor who dressed like the Queen of England. These widely circulated stories created a common vocabulary through which these occurrences were understood. To be recognized as a woman in 1777, the Chevalier donned feminine clothing, but she also donned a narrative of her life story that made sense of her gender nonconformity. When she sat down to write her memoirs, she mobilized this same vocabulary. When we think of the 18th century, we tend to imagine a society strictly divided on binary lines. Men wearing waistcoats, breeches, and tricorn hats, managing politics and business, while women in petticoats, gowns, and caps manage the home and raise children. I argue that not only did trans and gender nonconforming people exist in the 18th century Atlantic world, but also that they made use of a common recurring narrative language to explain and make themselves acceptable when they express their genders in nonconforming ways. 
We can identify this language by comparing the narrative the Chevalier Dion produced in her memoirs with other trans narratives from across the British and French empires. A modern example of the kind of narrative tropes that I look at would be something like the phrase coming out of the closet, which everyone understands these days, but it is also a particular linguistic way of framing queer experience that hasn't always existed. As ubiquitous as the phrase feels to us today, it only originated in the mid to late 20th century. Everyone has a unique experience with their gender and sexuality, but the ways in which we communicate these experiences to others have to be mutually understood. I look at the words and stories we use to make sense of ourselves and to make ourselves make sense to other people. I argue that this kind of vocabulary, while very different from our modern day ones, existed in the 18th century Atlantic world. There are a lot of these tropes for a broad spectrum of experiences, just like there are nowadays. So today, I'll only be talking about one, that of the warrior woman. From her first account of her female life, Dion encouraged her contemporaries to consider her as a member of a pantheon of strong female warriors. Warrior women were non-normative. Soldiering was a strictly masculine pursuit. Women were not meant to take up arms. But war provided many individuals perceived by society as women the opportunity to experiment with gender. For Dion, who had convinced the world of her female sex, these gender non-conforming stories served as a narrative vocabulary she could use to explain her time as a man. Her memoir, La Vie Militaire Politique et Privée, opens with a portrait of Dion in armor, surrounded by the glories of her masculine life. Surrounded by military flags, a dragoon helmet, and an officer's sword, this Dion proudly displays her service to her country. A shield emblazoned with the French rooster and the phrase vigilant and bold rests atop a book open to a page listing all of the battles she fought in during the Seven Years' War. On the other side of the portrait are her political achievements, including her secret correspondence with Louis XV as a spy. If the armor and helmet were not enough to liken her to the goddess Athena, the Latin inscription around her profile makes the comparison directly by invoking the goddess's name. Patriotic zeal could justify a woman in a man's role, especially one who disguised herself to join the military. Warrior women took up arms for love of their countries. These women were viewed as honorary men. Rather than chastise their female protagonists, their stories chastised their male readers. Like Dion, the British Hannah Snell and the American Deborah Sampson mobilized this theme in their narratives. In Hannah Snell's tale, for instance, the men of Britain had so failed in their duties that they gave the braver and more daring Snell the right to dress and fight as a man. In the absence of appropriately masculine men to defend their homes and countries, an assigned female at birth individual like Hannah Snell could be reasonably compelled to pick up the slack. Patriotic fervor was at the core of the warrior woman trope. According to her memoir, Deborah Sampson was consumed by such passions while preparing to join the Continental Army during the American Revolution. The Chevalier Dion relied on similar justification. Her memoir repeatedly makes note of her love of king and country. In her telling, Louis XV was aware of her female sex and greatly approved of her accomplishments as both an officer and a statesman. Upon taking the throne, his successor, Louis XVI, discovered the secret. He was so impressed by Dion that he thought her talents were wasted abroad and called her back to France in 1777. Her duty done, she wrote, the king returned her to her proper garments and life, specifically feminine garments and life. Dion's memoirs begin with one portrait and end with a description of another. This 1773 British engraving once again depicts Dion in her military yet feminine glory. Holding a spear and a shield bearing Medusa's head, Dion is shown standing in front of a military tent in full Greek attire. One naked breast protrudes from the cloth draped around her unquestionably feminine figure. In the camp behind her, a regiment of dragoons waits on horseback for her command. In the foreground, muskets, regimental flags, a drum, a cannon, and cannonballs lie within reach. This was the woman whose valor and virtue her comrades honored. Draped in the symbolism of the strong women of antiquity, this was the image of herself that Dion cultivated through her memoirs. Though it does not reprint the image, the memoir describes it in great detail and prints the inscription in full. Dedicated by Dion's military comrades, the Latin inscription read, 
to Pallas Athena, wounded but not defeated, famous in war and in negotiation, and always for the honor of her country and glory. Heroine whose valor few men could imitate and whose virtue even her enemies could not attack. Ending her first memoir with these powerful words, Dio highlighted her honor and love of king and country, things that surely society could not fault her for, as they hadn't for warrior women before her. At the Chevalier's death in 1810, an autopsy revealed that Dion had male genitalia. Because the Chevalier Dion was assigned male at birth, modern histories stubbornly continue to ignore Dion's self-fashioning. Most works on Dion use he, him pronouns. This decision both critically erases trans history and obscures much of what we can learn about how gender operated during Dion's time. Highlighting Dion's self-fashioning and the self-fashioning of others reveals a deep history of trans experience and diversifies our understanding of gender in the 18th century. Even after her transition, Dion was an unconventional woman, but not because of what was under her petticoats. A proper lady would not have found herself in a fencing duel with the Chevalier de Saint-Georges before the Prince of Wales, nor would she probably petition the revolutionary government to lead an all-female legion into war. By presenting herself as a virtuous and patriotic warrior woman, however, Dion made herself acceptable to Atlantic society, even celebrated. Gender nonconformity was surprising and intriguing as Dion's fame shows, but it was not illegible or incomprehensible. These alternative gender narratives were not prescribed, but they existed and were widely understood. They were not proper, but they could be acceptable. Many aspects of Dion's self-constructed narrative were invented, including the crucial detail that she was assigned female at birth. However, she did not invent the theme of the warrior woman. Rather, she mobilized it to her advantage. She blurred the edges of gender norms, but did so in a way long accepted and understood in both the British and French empires. Thanks, Caitlin, and thank you both uh, for your insightful papers. Um, so now that we've completed the paper presentations, we'll be moving into the moderated panel discussion to expand on the theme of the panel and dive deeper into the topics that, that you guys have discussed. And should any of our audience members want to continue this discussion, please join us for our live Q&A thread hosted on the Ask Historian subreddit dedicated to this panel. Um, and I also want to encourage you both, if you have questions you'd like to pitch out uh, as we proceed, please uh, feel free to do so. So the first thing is that you two uh, have described almost complete opposites. Caitlin, you have a, a, a wonderful example of an out and proud trans, well, well, I don't know if they would have identified themselves as trans, but definitely somebody who made a very public spectacle of their transition. And Matthew, who is describing how um, the, these identities are rejected and erased. Um, I, I think we've seen that um, uh, in a number of other places. And so my first question is, uh, how could we, we reconcile or explain this, this, this spectrum that is developed? Not in the sense that I think either one of you were wrong and we need to come to a middle place, but rather um, how do we wind up in, how have we, as a field of historians who are presented with such evidence, uh, created uh, this, this dichotomy in which we either have spectacular exceptions or people whose biographies need to be rewritten in a way that is more palatable when the whole idea of queer studies in the first place is to turn those narratives on their head. So let me throw that out there and just, just ask you to ruminate on that for a bit before, before we proceed. Thanks for the question, Chris. I think it really, it does feel like there is a, a separation between our two papers, but I do have to say like, you know, part of the part of my challenge in my work is even just using she, her pronouns to refer to Dale. Um, like for me, going into the research and reading her memoirs, I was like, this this reads like a trans woman. Like this is this is awesome. Um, and then looking at the secondary sources, which you know, for the most part are relatively older, queer history as a field has been relatively, you know, new. 
And, you know, they're like, just, oh, like, you know, we're just gonna, we're just using he, him pronouns. Some places didn't even question it, right? Other historians gave reasons for it that I personally do not agree with. Um, mm -hmm. And mostly boiled down to like, well, you know, she had a penis, therefore, you know, uh, which we've all heard that before. Um, so definitely when I was like, we're listening to Matthew's paper, I was like, oh yeah, I feel this so hard. Uh, <laughs> but, and then even just on the, like the fact that she feels like she, she is exceptional. I certainly will not mm -hmm. say that the Chevette is not exceptional, mm -hmm. but part of, I think, the reason why she comes off as so exceptional and kind of part of the reason why my research is shaped the way it is, is just that so few of these gender non-conforming and trans people left things for us to left th behind things in their historical record for us to look at, um, which is one of the challenges for my research. And I think the best example of that is just like, you know, we have two memoirs from Dion and like a whole like archive full of papers. And another person who I didn't actually mention today, I have one piece of paper about him and it is two paragraphs and it's not even written by him it's written by the court of tennessee and that is it uh, <laughs> so like it it's there's there's a totally understandable level of you know we don't have enough information about this one person to really talk about him in any sort of detail but part of what i want to do is bring those stories out and using daniel as sort of a skeleton upon which we can attach other things um, really allows me, hopefully, <laughs> successfully, to really bring those stories forth and hopefully combat the sort of erasure that Matthew's talking about. Right. Right. Matthew, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I think what struck me, I think there's often what I'd call a Friends of Dorothy problem in the field. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and um, that is, Randy Schultz wrote about this in his Conduct Unbecoming. There was a very infamous chapter in U.S. military history where the Naval Investigative Service kept finding that there were these men who had enrolled in the Navy, and they were all homosexual, and they kept referring to themselves as friends of Dorothy. And the Naval Investigative Service spent a large amount of resources trying to find this woman in Chicago named Dorothy that all of these homosexuals were friends with. And, <laughs> you know, it wasn't actually that. It was Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz because right, Judy right. Garland was a famous gay icon. <laughs> and I think often the problem you hit in the field is, as Caitlin mentioned, there's often not a lot of sources that are written down and some of this is, yes, they didn't write it down, but a lot of it is also, when you look at queer history, I mean, even today, there is a lot of coded language that gets mm -hmm. used. Um, I mean, Friends of Dorothy was th the example, but you know, if you are in queer circles, you know of all of the different coded language that gets used and it can kind of, there can be a reluctance to accept this coded language as actual queerness. Mm -hmm. But I think the other problem you hit on is, you know, you have someone like the Chevalier de, de Yon, she is very proud and she will be very out about it. And then you have on the other spectrum, someone like Billy Tipton, who he spent his entire life trying to hide it. And that is a very, that still is something that comes up a lot in queer circles between people who try to just pass and don't really make a big deal of their identity and those who it's central. The problem we hit is for the people who aren't as open about it and try to use that coded language, there's often this rejection of the idea that the coded language is valid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that only really make is only really persuasive if you aren't someone existing in those queer communities that's aware of that that coded language all the time yeah absolutely i totally agree i think that's one of the things i think about a lot in the work i do is the sort of like the the coded language i look at like a little bit less necessarily like queer community language just because it's a little bit harder for me to find in the 18th century right but there is still this like issue of like oh well you know 
is it valid? Is this truly queer? And here I'm thinking a lot about the work of Claire Sears and a lot of other trans historians who are really like bringing this out of like, you know, well, for instance, right, I mentioned Deborah Sampson in my talk, a lot of people would be like, oh, but you know, I think of her as a cis woman. And that's a totally valid interpretation, right? Her, val her memoir only ever used she, her pronouns. She talked about being a woman in the army, totally legitimate. Um, but, and like, I don't, I'm not in the business of policing like gender lines, right? Or like what counts as queer. Um, and I think that that's really important in the sort of work that we do because, you know, okay, regardless of what someone like Deborah Sampson thought about her own identity, the behavior, the action she took in dressing as a man, as in joining the army, in how she spoke about it afterwards to make her gender nonconformity acceptable so that she wouldn't be like reviled for it, right? Those were all transgressive actions in return in terms of gender, right? Those all transgress gendered lines. And I think by casting those as like not queer does us a more of a disservice than it does a service, right? Those are still really important moments, especially when, because I actually, I read Deborah Sampson stuff first. And when I got to the Chevalier Dion, I was like reading her memoirs. I was like, oh, I've heard this song before, right? And so that really allowed me to do something, I think just more interesting in terms of like, oh, like this is the sort of, you know, the language, the vocabulary that these people are using and that are understood by multiple people, even just like, you know, people on the street have heard of these warrior women or what have you, right? Because they're these sort of mythical figures. Um, but yeah, so I think there's a lot of like, they didn't say they were trans, but they made me, they weren't necessarily thinking of their gender identity specifically, but they were doing things that we definitely should consider as part of queer history. Yeah, I, I think one of the, the the things you just you just picked up on is is the the concept of transgression. And I think there is something transgressive about queer history itself to a degree. So I, I think, for example, and this is by way of setting up my next question. Um, in my own work, I, I work on 19th and 20th century Egypt. At the beginning of the 19th century, uh, complete opposite of today, the Middle East was where you went to be sexually licentious, whereas now it's the place where you go to be sexually uh, 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 deprived. Um, and there's this very famous um, uh, sort of ethnographer, Englishman who went to live there. And um, he was a bachelor. Um, and of course, this is the Victorian era, so the, immediately the fact that he's a lifelong bachelor immediately starts to to raise question marks in my head. Um, his sister came out. His sister came out, um, and visited for several years, and she was his best friend, and you know, wrote a book about life in the harem. And um, but you know, he complains to his male Egyptian friends that he can't go in further into their home because he's not married, and many of them offer to marry him to a cousin, and he refuses. And finally, later in his life. Um, he marries a Greek slave woman um, to whom he leaves all of his property. And of course, one of the, the catch here is that under Egyptian law at the time, um, you know, she'd be freed upon her death, upon his death um, and to, in order to inherit the property, which, you know, and I, I start putting dots together and I'm like, okay, so he doesn't want to marry uh, any of his friend's relatives because what he does in the bedroom might get back to them. And, um, you know, he marries a woman whose silence, whose inheritance is basically a contingent on her silence, right? And and I, I start, you know, searching around, has anybody put these pieces together? No, no one has ever, ever suggested this guy might have been, I, I, I'm not even gonna say gay, I'm going to say had same sex attraction, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it was just, it was, it was very, um, you know, I mean, it, to me, I'm like, hello, <laughs> sorry, that is professional moderator speak. Um, so here's my question, um, you know, and we can take it wherever we'd like, but how should we approach some of these uh, historical individuals who may not ever have openly acknowledged, um, same sex attraction, same sex behavior, um, or living other or, or living a preferred gender identity that did not match with their biological uh characteristics mm -hmm. um how should we approach these people as modern historians in so much as we choose to ascribe to them identities they may not have taken upon themselves mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think in my own work, for instance, right, like in my whole talk, and I do this throughout all my research, I never actually referred to the Chevalier Dion as a trans woman, right? Like I never actually was like, she was a trans woman. I said things like, you know, she, you know, rewrote this story. She lived as a man. She rewrote the story of her having been raised a girl, et cetera, et cetera. She was assigned male at birth and then lived as a woman, all these sorts of things. And I think part of that is important to me in terms of like, you know, there's a, this acknowledgement that the words trans woman, right, didn't exist in the 18th century. If you went back in time and said this to her, she'd be like, I don't know what you're saying, even if you said it in French, right? Um, but at the same time, those experiences, I think, are still really important to acknowledge as trans female experience, mm -hmm. right? Trans mm -hmm. feminine experiences. Because at, again, it's one of the, I think we've all had the like, oh my God, how has no, how has no one seen this? Like, have you seen this? Like everyone's had that moment, I think, in like our circles. Um, and I think that's part of I, so I I personally balance that between like I balance the like, well, I'm going to explain and show how these experiences did exist in history, how pe our people do have a, a history, right? But at the same time, I'm going to avoid necessarily using those modern identities in sort of long form discussions. With my friends, I always do the like, she was totally trans, right? Like, but in a professional situation, I kind of avoid using that just to kind of shorthand the sort of discussion I'm giving right now. Of like, well, those words didn't exist, but the feelings did, that sort of thing. Um, so that's how I personally kind of balance it and try to keep my own understandings and biases about gender like in check while doing this history. Yeah, I, you know, when I first started in history, I was really interested in Byzantine history. Ooh. And it's interesting to me that the term we use for that is Byzantine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, because that's not, that is a very modern invention. If you, I mean, uh, you know, as Caitlin said about the Chevalier, even if you could speak to them in French, if you called them a trans one, they'd be like, what, what is that? What are you talking about? But like, if you went to the Byzant, if you went up and you're like, oh yeah, you're the Byzantine emperor, like, like no, I'm the Roman <laughs> oh, emperor. emperor. Yeah, yeah, right. This is the Roman Empire, and that is something that kind of struck me in in those works. It's you know when I started a, when I started, I would do Byzantine history, and they'd just be like, oh yeah, they're the Greek Byzantines. And no one really bat batted too much of an eye over the fact that they would have not thought of themselves as Greek or Byzantine, but that's what we use. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a double standard there where we have all this preoccupation about, well, they wouldn't have thought of themselves as trans ones, so we can't call them that. Like, okay, but, you know, they also wouldn't have thought of themselves as Byzantine, and we've just accepted that as the term. Mm -hmm. Um. But I think the other part that struck me, I think there's a difficulty because, you know, there are cases like the Chevalier, she is more open about that, mm -hmm. but it did strike me as well, you know, for Byzantine history, you hit very quickly that any, you know, later his more antiquity even, you don't have a lot of sources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. sources you do have are the ones that, you know, some monk somewhere decided were important enough to copy down. <laughs> well, there's a difficulty that even if someone was using the language of I am homosexual, we don't know that that would have survived because but, yeah, that's the point. If this is a history being recorded primarily by, you know, members of the clergy, they might look at it and go, hmm nope, we don't think that's worthy of keeping recorded. Mm -hmm. Which is where you get the difficulty of, we're trying to sort through a bunch of coded language where we don't know what's all missing. We don't, we can't say for certain that they didn't at some point refer to themselves using these kinds of terms. And then it just got lost because we have a lot of things that went lost. And so it's kind of, for me, it's usually a, I like using the phrase queer because queer is one of those more umbrella things where you can just say, this is not in the norm. Mm -hmm. 
Exactly. And we should acknowledge that it's not in the norm, even if we don't have, you know, we might not be able to say specifically they were lesbian, they were trans, they were whatever, but we can at least acknowledge they aren't what we would expect. And mm -hmm. I think it's that not fitting what we would expect that should be noted and we shouldn't feel so compelled to be like, but what if they were actually just really good gal pals that got buried together? They were roommates. They were roommates, <laughs> they were roommates. They were roommates. yeah. <laughs> and I think part of it as well for, you know, que queer history is dominated by queer people. That's just a, <laughs> that's just a reality. But I think for queer people, it's easier to identify like, okay, yes, they didn't necessarily call themselves that, but you can still see in their writings, like they're struggling with how they're identifying and they're using this language that's suggestive. And we can be familiar with that because a lot of us went through it ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I remember speaking with one of my friends who is a trans lesbian and she mentioned like, you know, you look through some of these papers and it's like, if I, if I had been alive at that period and left the records I did, they would be writing about me that no, I was a man and I was totally straight. Yeah. And I'm not. <laughs> yeah. And it's, I think there's a difficulty there where it's, we don't want to assign an identity to them that they wouldn't have had. But at the same time, we do assign identities that they didn't have all the time. It's just, we assign the cis normative and the heteronormative identities and those are more accepted. Yeah. I think that's a really good point actually is I think both of you have brought up that um and it's funny because we we as uh as as queer people we're so used to this is that heteronormative is it's 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 like Napoleonic law it's like you are that until you prove otherwise right you know mm -hmm. um and even though we we have so much documentation uh to the, to the to the contrary um but so so let me flip that around <laughs> um and ask where the other end of that line is um so for example i'm and i'm thinking the first person who comes to mind probably is john boswell right with his ideas about you know well you know there were marriages in the medieval church uh you know etc which uh, a lot of historians have taken issue with um so is there is there is there a too far there Mm -hmm. um in some of our, our our queer readings of history i know so many people who are going to be mad that i asked this question by the way <laughs> <laughs> i personally feel like i mean there, there's part of me that wants to be like no we've had enough of cis normative hi history i want everything to be queer right and i think you know part of, but the concern is is valid in terms of i think that the importance of the importance of that line is really an acknowledgement that gender is culturally and geographically bound, or is also temporally bound. I think that there's we as historians have to acknowledge, right, that gender meant different things to different people in different places at different times, mm -hmm. and that by kind of wholesale being like, you know, let's take our things and put it on, you know, a past history does have a problematic issue there, right? Um, I do think that the pendulum has gone too far in the other way, right? Like that we've, we've been taking our cis normative things and putting that on the past for so long. But I think there, it, it, I think we're nowhere near that right now of the opposite happening, right? I, I think we've got a long way to go before that becomes like a serious problem. Um, but it's still an important kind of, and it's still important work we have to do as historians of, you know, sitting with our understandings of gender and sexuality and acknowledging that these are, you know, ours, they're bound by like, right, I am white, right, I am in this time period, I'm in the United States, right, all that sort of stuff. Um, one is just useful for being like a good person in general, right, but then is also really necessary to being a good historian. But at the same time, we make narrative decisions, we always do, everybody does, right, in telling our stories. So, and those will always be informed at least a little bit by who we are as people. So we can't completely combat that. Um, but I guess more of keeping it in mind. I think that's the, the, the danger is more just the importance of it of keeping it in the back of your mind. Like, yeah, okay, reel it back in a little bit. <laughs> I think 
in general, if you were to say someone has gone too far in making a claim one way or the other, I mean, yes, but that's going to happen everywhere <laughs> in history. I mean, it, you yeah. know, do I think there are people who have gone out and been like, this person is queer and have had like no real backing to stand on? Yeah. Of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, identify a position that seems extreme and someone has had it. Yeah. But I think it's, you know, I remember when I read Bennett's lesbian-like paper, one of the things that really stuck out when I was reading that was she makes the point that there is the part of history that is, you know, just doing history for history's sake and this kind of antiquarian view that she called it of just, we are documenting this because that's our job. We document things. Mm -hmm. But she also made the case there that we don't just do history to do history. People have a reason why they do history. And if we go a bit far on making a claim, we do need to evaluate, is there a purpose there? Even if we are wrong, is there still a purpose in making that claim just so that it is combating yeah. itself a bad... Uh, one of the things that came to mind here was, I know this is slightly a field, but like the 1619 Project, I know that mm -hmm. is something that was deeply controversial among historians. There were a lot of valid criticisms of the history in that project, but what struck me was then you get the 1776 project that's supposed to be in response, and you can see, like, they don't even have citations. <laughs> They're openly plagiarizing things at a point, and it's it's kind of fun. I looked at them, like, this is kind of illustrative where the 1619 project you know, there were places where you could critique it, but it wasn't overall, like, it wasn't just riddled with problems. And the response to it is completely divorced from history. And so there's a bit when on that where, yes, I think there are some histories that go too far and make too many claims about historical queerness, but the default for so long has been there is no queerness anywhere mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you are only queer if you have two forms that are notarized and signed in triplicate affirming <laughs> that you are queer um yeah. i actually remember one of the papers that one of the articles that i came across early when writing this was an article by danielle scrimshaw where she noted that generally to accept a historical figure as queer, there's this standard of like, you need to have evidence of explicit sexual contact. And even that sometimes isn't sufficient for people. Yes. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, to declare someone straight, you just need like evidence that at one point they, that he looked at a woman and didn't vomit is sufficient <laughs> there. And it's, I think it's just an awareness of what level of evidence are we expecting here where, you know, if we're saying, oh, we can't conclude that they were queer, but we can conclude they were great friends. It's why are you expecting more evidence for a romantic relationship than a platonic one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like and as as you were speaking, I was actually thinking like because I did I this is my thing has been like this is my master's thesis in a slightly different sense as well. And when I first presented my master's thesis like idea to the professors of George Mason, I was like, this is this is my idea. I'm very scared, right? <laughs> Please say it's good. Um, and one of my favorite professors came up to me and was like, hey, you know, like it's even just the concept of you know not taking gender for granted. Like, that's really cool. Like, I haven't thought about that. And I was like, yeah, like, even if it does, even if you're, you know, where do we draw the line of what is truly queer, right? The, the act of actually just questioning, but like, oh, well, you know, he was clearly straight because he had a wife. And you're like, doesn't really prove anything. Um, like, you know, actually just at the act of questioning that when it's so like, usually like, you know, so far has been really, for the most part, kind of not questioned is I think an important historical task that we have to do. So. Yeah, and you know, I 
I thought of as well during this, there was I remember in 2017, there was this burial site in Berka, Sweden. It, it was a very well-known one because it's one of the most well-preserved. The person who originally uncovered it was very thorough in documenting this burial site that was held up originally as, look at this great evidence we have for how warriors were treated in Sweden because they were buried in with all of these ornate weapons, they had horses nearby, all of these things we associate with a soldier or a martial figure. And then research led by Charlotte Henderstina Johnson in 2017 said, hmm, they were a woman. And suddenly it became, well, what if someone else's bones got mixed up in that burial site? Or what if they've just mislabeled it and her response in a paper to you in a follow-up paper was if these objections were valid they were valid when the initial discovery was made that you're only bringing them up now that we're saying this was a woman buried here mm -hmm. shows that you aren't really object those aren't really your objections you're just objecting to that story in general and you're going to glom on to anything you can use to dispute that story. And mm -hmm. I think that's something very familiar in queer history, in queer history where it's, you're objecting to calling them queer, but you're doing it in more neutral terms to look like your objection isn't just that this is a queer story. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think we've all sort of seen like we, you know, this is in the context of history, but like we've also all seen this sort of argumentation, even in just like the validity of queer people today. Right. Like we've right. all seen that sort of like, well, you're not actually this unless you are also this other the whole like form and triplicate thing. So I think that the it's important to do this in terms of, you know, getting a good diverse history, but also in terms of, hey, like both these Gen these trans and queer experiences have existed and so too has this sort of back and forth nobody can agree on where we draw the lines thing has also sort of existed through all of time right. as well well it's because the lines are messy right exactly. they're, um, not, they're not lines they're just kind of blurry blobs <laughs> yeah. you know i mean i mean i've i you know i i, I one, of, one of my interests is it's not my my research inter uh, field but you know i i work on early islamic history and there, there's this whole history of of speaking of form cited triplicate you know men who <laughs> literally write poetry about you know the male lovers they've taken although there's this other school of thought that the lovers are really god um and um which is true in some of the sufi poetry because it, there there is this idea of the god as the lover but th there's other kinds where they're very clearly describing actual things um but um but they're like well you know but he was married and had he's married and he had children um completely leaving aside the idea that there is this accommodation in society but it exists as long as you fulfill your filial duty which is you will marry a woman you will produce heirs and then you can have all the gay sex you want, but you will do these other things first, right? And so, again, going back to that, to what we were talking about earlier, the sort of idea is that those people will always be coded as straight mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. um, e even though, you know, they themselves are out, <laughs> well, I did him last week, and that one was a tough catch, but I finally got him, you know? And it's like, <laughs> again, you start to ask yourself, God? really uh, <laughs> you know. um yeah but you know and 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 so it, this is this is where the, the, the these the, the these it's like because as we've all been saying it is messy mm -hmm. right? right um the whole field is messy and and i feel like i think one of the things that's interesting about this is a lot of speaking again of the triplicate form a lot of the early studies really were sex centered around sex mm -hmm um places people had it do it you know but it but it was like that that was the entree point i think for a lot of queer history and then like i mean as you were talking i was like and then there's always like you know there's the issue of just people can be bi 
necessary. Like just that never speaking, also speaking of erasure, right? Speaking yeah. of erasure, right? Yeah. We're mostly talking about trans issues and like lesbian issues, but like, you know, he could have a wife and a gay lover at the same time. Like, wow. Um, which I think there also needs to be more, more work on that. But like, you know, yeah. just it's yeah. It's very much like not only are there, I guess not only is everyone's just straight until proven otherwise, but eh, maybe not. Um, there's also like, well, there's certainly no in between. Certainly not that. Oh, no, <laughs> never. No. No. Um, his poetry was about God and he only slept with his wife. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I, I had the thought there. I know it was, it's funny to me that, you know, you can even look, there are plenty of historians that will say, well, Sappho's poetry that is about women was actually, she's just writing about them romantically because she was commissioned to do so. And Sappho had no sapphic feelings. Like it, it's literally the name. <laughs> yeah, but, it's in know, the name, guys. <laughs> I, I even had the thought, you know, well, they were, they're married and they have kids. And I'm like, okay, so are half of the guys that hit me up on Grinder. So like... <laughs> You know, you're not supposed to say that in front of the children, Matthew. <laughs> yeah, and and that's that. It's one of the things where it is. You know, I I go back. I started in Byzantine history, and I remember the Alexiad is a very famous work, and I was the first time that I looked through some of the debates. I remember just being floored that there are these people arguing there's no way something like this could have been written by a woman. It's too detailed. She knows right. too much about troop movements. How would she have this knowledge? Like, finally, I found someone that's like, no, this had to have been bit written by a woman. And at first, I was really thrilled. And then I read the next part where Edward Gibbon argues that, no, of course, the Alexiad was written by a woman. It's too egotistical and centers the author too much. Oh. Like, and I think that's, that's kind of the that reminds me on the sex where you know it's there is kind of an assumption in a lot of circles that is very unfortunate that queer people are just sexually mm -hmm. livicious and you know they they just unlike the good pure straight people they're just out everywhere doing it all the time so if you don't see and as a result you end up with the judgment of well if they're not out there doing the sex all the time how can they be queer because Queer right. people do sex all the time. And it's, you get into a lot of the arguments, unfortunately, end up being just kind of stereotypical of they can't be queer because this is our vision of queer and they're not matching that 100%. And I think that that's the importance of kind of for us as historians of casting the net widely, right? To catch these, right. to find these people is that like, you know, I mean, the Chevalier de Lyon provides an amazing example of someone who like I see it and I'm like, I know who that is, right? But at the same time, it's just as queer to be doing something that might not necessarily as easily line up with what we might be looking for. And the other thing, of course, that this brings up is the question of, of the silences in the archive. Um, you know, and again, I go back to, you know, I'm, I'm fairly... Uh, I, active on ask historians you know a lot of people always ask about well where is the evidence and 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 you know there there's a number of us who keep trying to get in the point that sometimes uh the fact that nobody wants to talk about it or only speaks about it in circumspect is is also evidence it's you know um and so it's about reading the silences because sometimes they're deliberate and learning how to look for those clues most of the sources that I look at, a lot of them um, are like were intended for public consumption, right? Which inherently has a sort of like there's going to be elements of fabrication, even if it's like a perfectly like you know cis normative heterosexual person. There are right. going to be sort of fabric. It's like social media. We all want to look really nice online, right? Um, and so that with these sort of stories of people like the Chevalier or Deborah Sam, sort of, or all of these stories were meant for public consumption. So what are they saying and what are they not saying? Or what are they saying in a particular way? These were people who were seeking acceptance, right? They were writing these stories to say like, no, like I, I'm doing it right. I'm mm -hmm, a good mm -hmm. person. You should not run me out of town and call me a witch or whatever, right? Um, and so that inherently has 
you know, both is issues in terms of we have to read the sources very carefully, but it's also very interesting in terms of it allows us to see not only what they're saying, but also what they think society expects them to say. I, I think one of the difficulties in our archives is just the very, it's the very brutal truth that you're not going to find in a lot of history, people speaking openly about how they deviate from society because that's just not something that people write about that often yeah or any kind of yeah. deviation from society mm -hmm. uh, you know it's you'll find examples but you know we don't have a lot of i think to like early church history our knowledge of a lot of early christian heresies exists only because we have people arguing against them that survived and similarly a lot of our records of queerness in history is just records of people arguing against it mm -hmm. and that's something that we you know i remember in this discussion it's okay if they if it is something that they've outlawed and that they are speaking against frequently that means it happened yep you don't yeah. go out and you don't go out and pass you know laws against homosexuality and give sermons against homosexuality if homosexuality consists of two out of one million people, mm -hmm. you know, you'd have bigger things to talk about. And the difficulty becomes that for a lot of it, we only have records from the people opposed to it. Mm -hmm. But the people opposed to it have reason then to be arguing that it's not real as well. And it can become, you know, it's an unfortunate trap that I see frequently where if you have, I think to like, the trans one in particular, the Roman emperor, like, the Roman emperor that was described as trans, you know, there's a lot of people that say, well, only his political enemies described him as that. So how do we know that he really did want to dress up as a woman? Mm -hmm. But you get the difficulty of, well, yes, your political enemies would describe that, but we also don't, we're not accepting that as real, but we also wouldn't accept it as real if you know, his political enemies went and destroyed all of his records. Yeah. Because they didn't want there to be records of trans identities. Mm -hmm. It just becomes difficult when you're trying to discuss something that there's reasons why we would expect it to not be present in the record. And we can really only find it by looking for people arguing against it. And I think that just the difficulty of finding things, because we've been talking a lot about how people spoke about queer identities at various times, the fact that we, they didn't use the words that we would use today. You can't go into an 18th century archive or like an online database and plug in the word trans and get kind of right. anything. You might, you might like find like trains misspelled or something, but like you're not going to find someone talking about queer issues with the words queer or lesbian, like in the, in the far past, right? Because those words just won't didn't they weren't there um so like you know the fact like part of what i started my research was just literally just keeping a list of like these are words that i think will find something and hopefully it'll be found and like some of the things that i have found were only because of like these long strings of like you know clothing and such and such near five words of man and or woman right to like try and just find the way they were first i had to figure out how they would have spoken about it and then actually finding them if they're even still there um so it's like the added difficulty of actually like even if they did survive can we even necessarily find them and thank god for search tool. that's with the search tool. yeah like, i, I was just thinking like, cause that the particular thing I'm thinking of is a court record from Tennessee. And I personally have no reason to be in an archive in Tennessee and certainly would not have looked in whatever folder that was in to try and find this one tiny document. Um, so like, yay, digital era. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just I was just thinking as you were saying <laughs> that that one of the questions that keeps coming up is why is all this revisionist history happening now? And and that's why is suddenly Actually we have funded. access, you know, um is we have we have access to things in places we wouldn't necessarily look. You know, I work on Egypt. It wouldn't occur to me to be looking at archives in Japan, right? Yeah. But right. you know, now I can do that if if I want to. So I really want to thank you both. This has been a great discussion. Um, I, I think this has been a great uh, example of what, of what this this field can really bring to the table in terms of of sort of giving us a new light on history, especially um, you know for 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 those of us who really are hoping to see what our who our antecedents were in the past and how they lived their lives. Um, So I want to just give you both the opportunity to make some uh, final thoughts before we conclude, uh, especially if you'd like, there's anyone you'd like to credit or or acknowledge. So uh, I will turn it over first to Caitlin uh, and then Matthew. Thank you. And at first, I want to thank both you and Matthew. This was an amazing discussion. So I'm so happy we were able to have this panel and thank you to Ask Historians for even having it. I, I, I still am so thrilled that this kind of panel exists, that this kind of conference overall exists, but that this kind of panel can exist and we can actually have discussions about these sorts of things. Um, And I also want to thank all my people at George Mason who have been super supportive in this research that I'm doing. It's like without their support, I thought when I first started my grad school career that I wasn't going to be able to do this sort of research, um, either because people wouldn't want me to say it or because it wouldn't be something I could find. So thank you to you know, Randolph Scully is my dissertation advisor and especially George Oberly at the library for helping me with those ridiculous search space, search functions that I had to come up with, so. (laughs) I'd like to first thank Ask Historians and all those on the back end that are helping to make this conference. I know if you're not associated with an institution, there's not a lot of conferences. So I would like to thank them for just the openness there on letting in people from other backgrounds that normally wouldn't be in conferences to present. Um, I would also like to thank those from previous work, uh, the professors I worked with at University of Oregon at Augustana University that helped me figure out a bit more how to do history well and how to think on these questions and the communities both at Ask Historians and the other communities online that I worked with to develop some of this research and that helped kind of challenge some of the beginning thoughts and develop the paper where it went. And also I'd like to thank my other panelists. I know we had, there's been a lot of changes here, but glad we could make the, get this panel up and have people around to talk about an issue that I think is really important right now. Okay. Well, once again, I want to thank both Caitlin and Matt and to the organizers and to all those of you who are attending the Ask Historians Digital Conference. This concludes this panel session. Please catch the other ones on the website.